Edgar Casey answers life's 10 most important questions. It seemed fitting that I should recount the results of my own quest, casting aside my journalistic reserve and revealing the personal. A task like that is awkward for me, perhaps because I'm so used to hiding behind the dispassionate mask of detachment we journalists assume as we forcibly dig out the most personal information from other people. But it would be only fair, I decided, and probably good for me, to make the attempt, to give myself a taste of my own medicine by, in effect, giving myself an intensive interview. I present my answers here in the hope that they will afford you some perspective on what the Casey material can mean to a benevolent skeptic like me. Is there a God? Has Edgar Casey established or reinforced the belief that God exists? If so, how? What is life? A manifestation of the first cause, God. The divine, the first cause, is mindful of the entity. This is evidenced by the very fact that the entity finds itself conscious of being itself and aware of good and evil, light and darkness, life and death. I have to admit that Casey has clearly reinforced my belief. It existed before, but at rather low voltage. Now I find that Casey's concept that the creative forces of the universe are manifestations of God makes it possible for me to conceptualize God as an omniscient, omnipresent pool of infinite energy that can be drawn on in a personal, direct way at any time. It has become easier for me to conceive of opening the self up to this divine inflow to let it permeate every cell of the body, which creates at least a psychological infusion of energy that becomes almost palpable and can at times result in physical energy. There is, at times, a sense of refueling, so to speak. I also find, in visualizing this, that there is a sense of personal comfort and relief in letting go, turning myself over to a higher power. Because Casey pictures God as merged with the physical, mental, and spiritual anatomy of each entity, rather than as a detached anthropomorphic figure, there is no longer a sense of separation, and I can picture God as truly personal and within me. What is the real purpose of my life? Has Edgar Casey helped determine your purpose in life? If so, how? What is the real purpose of my present incarnation? and the work best suited to its fulfillment and to my complete integration. As may be drawn in inference and application from those activities that have been in the earth, that of unifying man to his oneness with that creative force we call God. Each soul realizes, should realize, that each manifestation, each expression, is an opportunity that the individual entity may be a living example, known and seen of those whom the entity may meet, of the fact that God is. Casey placed considerable emphasis on setting an ideal to define our purpose in life. Although I have had difficulty with this, others have reported great success. As a result of culling the Casey material, however, the idea of getting with it, that is, getting in tune with the universe, has turned out to be helpful to me since I am a somewhat timid explorer of the vast cosmic domain. I have never been able, as Margaret Fuller was, to flatly accept the universe. I suppose my resistance can be ascribed to stubbornness, ego, and other aspects of bullheadedness. I have now become able to set the ideal of getting into attunement with the universe and find it surprisingly beneficial. Through Casey's benign influence I have been able to set a regular time each day to meditate about this, which is not as easy as it sounds. But in doing so I find myself able to make a smooth shift into the cosmos without grinding gears. If there is one factor in meditation that stands out, it is the self-command to be still. When I forcibly bring myself to that screeching stop, it's amazing how minor problems and distractions automatically lose their abrasiveness. I had not been able to do this before. Casey's admonitions about impatience have been helpful here. They have smoothed the way by making it possible for me to aim toward a harmony with the cosmos instead of fighting it with futile kicking and scratching. With this achievement as a long-term goal, I find the difficulties of daily living easier to put up with. I still feel the urge to grab the wheel of spaceship Earth at times. But this urge has gradually weakened. 
I am more able to sail with the wind instead of fighting it. How can I find peace in a turbulent world? Has Edgar Casey helped you find peace in a turbulent world? If so, how? The entity finds himself as a co-creator with the divine that is manifested in self. Thus, if the choice leads the entity into the exalting of self, it becomes as naught in the end. If the choice is that self is to be used in whatever manner, as in the talents, the attributes, the associations with its fellow men, to glorify the creative force, then the body, the mind finds that peace, that harmony, that purpose for which it chose to enter material experience. Peace is the longing of the soul, and to be at one with creative forces alone may bring peace in the consciousness of any. My answer to this question flows from my answer to the previous question. By turning over to God and the cosmos decisions that are beyond my control, I am better able to put up with those things that are beyond my control and to work toward changing those things I can cope with. It's hard for me to admit that there are things happening in this world that are beyond my control. This is, of course, a ridiculous posture to take. The proper task is to clearly define those happenings that we can do something about and work on them constructively. If we take action on these, then we can justifiably say to hell with the turbulent world around us and replace futility with action. Casey's philosophy has been of considerable help with this. If we can get out of ourselves and turn our attention to other people, the ego is considerably relieved. I see in Casey's work a wonderfully clear road map. The problem that remains is learning to follow it. He prescribes a course of both acceptance and action that offers a way out if we can. How can I acquire my best health and highest energies? Has Edgar Casey helped you toward better health and energy? If so, how? All healing comes from the one source. And whether there is the application of foods, exercise, medicine, or even the knife, it is to bring the consciousness of the forces within the body that aid in reproducing themselves, the awareness of creative or God forces. I find that this is true in many subtle ways. Through Casey's reminder to strictly follow a regime of moderate exercise and sensible diet each day, I have found a source of detectable fresh energy and better body tone. Almost everybody realizes the need for exercise. It is simply the reminder to give this a high priority that helps me override the tendency to procrastinate. Casey has prompted me to start each day with exercise in spite of other pressures that seem more important at the time. This priority on exercise seems to pay off in how I handle all the other jobs that come up later in the day. The same principle is true as far as diet is concerned. I can't study Casey without becoming more conscious of the importance of watching my diet. In becoming more conscious of this, it becomes easier to discipline myself to bypass the tempting junk foods and reach for the more nutritious vegetables instead. Casey's diet recommendations were well ahead of their time, yet they are simple enough to utilize easily. Very important to me has been Casey's stress on holistic health and healing routines. These were also laid down well before today's recognition of their value. Through meditation, and by visualizing the body at optimum functioning, from the tiny cells up through the larger organs, many ailments are measurably relieved, even if the mechanism is undetected by the conscious mind. Both physical and emotional problems can be helped in this way, as several schools of modern medicine now recognize. How can I work and love at my highest capacities? Have you been helped to work and love at your highest capacity? If so, how? This is the whole law, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy body, thy soul, thy neighbor as thyself. If ye would have love, give. Since these qualities have been stated to be the end objectives of psychoanalysis, they are worth special attention. Some people have spent years in analysis, not to mention a heavy bankroll, to gain these objectives. Casey offers a less arduous and less expensive way to do the same thing. Having experienced both methods, I think I can say that Casey's way is at least equally efficacious. In general, 
psychoanalysis ignores the spiritual side of living and thus leaves a large gap. To work and love at the highest level is bound to involve the entire being. This includes the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. To work and love at our top level we often need to be inspired, and inspiration is more often than not a spiritual quality. By reaching for contact with what Casey calls the superconscious, the element of consciousness that has access to the divine, we are more likely to experience a more selfless love, a benign love that embraces others as well as ourselves. Casey's recognition of the reality of the spiritual dimension gives him a marked edge over the finite and limited Freudian outlook. How can I get rid of frustrations, hostility, and negative attitudes? Have you been helped to overcome frustrations, hostility, and negative attitudes? If so, how? Please explain why I seem to sob from within. Frustration of ideals brought about by apparent circumstance, in which much of that beautiful has been subjugated in the experience of the entity. It is the try that is the more often counted as righteousness, and not the success or failure. Failure to anyone should be as a stepping stone and not as a millstone. If there is any one question I've had the most trouble with, it is this one. I have an uncommonly strong urge to luxuriate in getting steamed up about certain people I dislike. I perversely enjoy collecting injustices and mulling them over in my mind. Casey has convinced me at long last that this is an unprofitable operation, less effective even than sticking pins in an effigy. He has brought me to recognize consciously that by working in this negative mode I am doing more harm to myself than to the target of my hostility, plus I waste a lot of valuable time. With Casey's advice in mind, I still have to forcibly reject negative thoughts by yanking my mind away from them by sheer force. Gradually this can become a habit, though, restoring time lost in negativity, and it might even bring a better sense of well-being. Another step Casey recommends is to look for the better nature in those who irk us. Of course, this is not easy either. There are some people in this world who seem to me to be congenital or self-made jerks. I find it hard to believe they have a good side. On the other hand, they have as much right to be in this world as I do. If I can't change them, I can at least put up with them. And if I can go further and forgive them, this might be the first step in forgiving myself, a practical idea of Casey's that has struck me as worth a good try. How can I overcome feelings of guilt and fear? Have you been helped to overcome guilt and fear? If so, how? The attitude is reflected more in that in which the individual entity meets its problems with itself as well as with others. If there are the worries and aggravations, these worries and aggravations will reflect in the functioning of the organs of the central nerve and blood supply as well as in the sympathetic. There cannot be a full mental and physical expression where the mental continuously condemns self for not doing that it knows to do, and excuses it in one way or another. Either fit the self to be the channel through which that it believes may express, or don't express that's what you claim to believe. According to psychoanalysis, guilt and fear can form the basis of many forms of neurosis. Since the combination of unjustified guilt and fear can mess up a lifetime in short order, I became especially interested in what Edgar Casey had to say about this. You see, I found I qualify as a fairly robust neurotic on both these counts. I have the capacity to dredge up guilt feelings even when there is no apparent reason for them. Emphasis on avoiding self-condemnation has helped me in this regard. Another helpful premise of Casey's is that if we recognize our inborn desire to link up with the creative force that put us here, and consciously work toward doing that, fears and guilt can be reduced. As I use the tool of meditation in an attempt to attune myself to the universe and to the creative force, I am finding a little relief. How can we know the will of God and the nature of a free will? Has Edgar Casey helped you find God's will and the nature of free will? If so, how? 
changes only come by the activity of the will. That which is the birthright to each soul from an all-wise creator whose desire and will is that no soul shall be separated from him, but that all shall find their place in his oneness. What, then, is will? That which makes for the dividing line between the finite and the infinite, the divine and the holy human, the carnal and the spiritual. For the will may be made one with him, or for self alone. With the will, then, does man destine in the activities of a material experience how he shall make for the relationships with truth. The trouble with God's will is that many of us find it hard to place it above our own. I am probably at the front of the line in this regard. Casey makes it plain that we should put God's will at the top of the priority list at all times. One affirmation Casey suggests we use to begin a meditation session is emphatic, not my will, but thine be done. Forcefully dwelling on this thought has been helpful. Still, we have to face the fact that God has given us our own stubborn and cantankerous will, which continually gets in the way. Casey's idea that we firmly align our will with God's can be of great benefit if we can only get around to doing it. One problem I have is a semantic one, the word will. It seems sort of threatening at times. We're not supposed to feel threatened by the divine creative force that put us here. At least I don't think we are. This is why I have substituted the word, design. For some reason it seems easier to flow with a design than with a will, and to think of God as the supreme architect of all time. Then I can use my own free will as a subcontractor to get to work and help carry out that design. I like to think that God is charitable enough to go along with this idea. Is there life after death? Has Edgar Casey helped you believe in life after death? If so, how? Where are the dead until Christ comes? Do they go direct to him when they die? As visioned by the beloved, there are those of the saints making intercession always before the throne for those that are passing in and out of the interbetween, even as he, the Christ, is ever in the consciousness of those that are redeemed in him. The passing in, the passing out, is as but the summer, the fall, the spring, the birth into the interim, the birth into the material. Edgar Casey drew a parallel that has helped me considerably with this question. His comparison suggests that death is a rebirth into a new dimension, one that follows the same natural pattern as does our birth into our present earthly existence. Despite the throes of childbirth, despite the many experiences of our earliest years, our progress from total unconsciousness to consciousness is impossible for us to recall. Casey leads us to believe that we might expect a similar experience upon our demise. Conceptually, this matches the findings of parapsychologists whose researches have demonstrated considerable evidence that life is continuous, and that some who have died suddenly did not even realize at first that they were dead. Further, Casey's belief in reincarnation and karma offers encouragement that we can make up for past mistakes and that we can progress toward our ultimate goal. What religion reveals the greatest truth? Have you found what religion reveals the greatest truth? If so, what? If ye would find and know mercy before him, be merciful and kind to those in whatever faith or whatever group ye may find them. 4. The Lord thy God is one. And the Christ, the Saviour, died for all, not for one. No sect, no schism, no ism, no cult. Edgar Casey has helped me understand the difference between religion and spirituality. As I understand it now, religion is a form of worship, while spirituality is an inner quest, a search to achieve at one to become part of the oneness of God, the Creator, Maker and first cause. It seems, then, that any religion that embraces this totality teaches the importance of following the cosmic laws, and thus is dedicated to the greatest truth. Casey subscribes to the Christ consciousness as the best path to achieving this. But he does not ignore the value of other great religions, and has been careful to avoid dependence on dogma and ritual. Beyond this, he has encouraged us to look within ourselves for a personal God, 
thereby avoiding the clatter and confusion of religion imposed by authority. In this way Casey avoids the tendency of some organized religions to condemn those who sincerely seek the truth in their own way. I have viewed with some dismay the fundamentalists of many faiths who violate other people's rights to seek God freely. Casey's approach to religion may be unorthodox and unique, but in the end I find his focus on the unity of all creation to be consistent with, not in conflict with, belief in the one supreme God.